إخواني السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الطفل محمد علي مصطفى حسن عمره ست سنوات في شهر محرم وهو خارجا من منزله وذاهبا إلى موكب حتى يساعد أبوه لزوار أبي عبد الله إجت سيارة ودعمته من ذاك اليوم هو يعني تقريبا أقدر أقول ما يحس يعني عنده شلل كامل في كل جسمه لأن الضربة كانت في الدماغ الولد عمره ست سنوات و علاجه بالطبع مش موجود في العراق علاجه يعني بعد ارسال الاوراق الى الهند العلاج موجود في الهند وذلك فقط عن طريق العلاج الطبيعي او بعض التمارين الصحيه طفل بعمر الزهور مثل محمد المفروض مثلا الحين يكون في المدرسة المفروض حاليا اليوم عنده دوام المفروض يرجع من مدرسته وهو يسوي واجباته يساعد أبوه مرة ثانية علما أن أبوه كذلك معاق على فكرة والعائل الوحيد لهذه الأسرة الكبيرة هو جدهم الحاج حسن الله يحفظه هذه العائلة ساكنين في منطقة تنتمي إلى أم البنين عليها السلام واسمها قرية أم البنين أنا بنفسي جاي لها حي أم البنين نعم أنا بنفسي جاي لهم سلام الله على أم البنين سلام الله عليها أسأل الله تعالى بأم البنين أن يشافي هذا الطفل البريء هذا الطفل الجميل وإن شاء الله يرجع إلى أهل بيته سالم غانم إخواني ترى علاج هذا الطفل ما يصير إلا في الهند والمصاريف والتكاليف عالية جدا وبأياديكم الكريمة وبسخاء جودكم إن شاء الله هاي الأسرة تتمكن أن تأخذ هذا الطفل للعلاج إلى الهند وإن شاء الله يرجع وهو معافى ويلبس ثوب الصحة والعافية الموكب اللي محمد كان يركض حتى يساعد أبوه لأن أبوه كان قاعد على الموكب أيام أربعيني في الحسين عليه السلام فمحمد كان يركض حتى يروح يساعد أبوه في الموكب هذا هو الموكب هاي أدوات الموكب اللي يوزعون شاي ماي تمر وبعض الأطعمة لزوار أبي عبد الله هذا هو أدوات الموكب وكل سنة هم يخدمون الحسين ولكن نتمنى السنة القادمة محمد يكون بين بين الخدام ويخدم زوار أبي عبد الله a duty towards the preservation and the propagation of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, one of the best ways to work towards the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi ajalallah ta'ala faraju sharif is through promoting the values of Karbala. Imam Hussein Media Group is the only Shia television network that broadcasts globally in five different languages, Arabic, Farsi, Turkish, Urdu, and English. We are appealing to the lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam worldwide to support the channel such that it may continue its global operations. Imam Hussein Media Group is seeking 1,000 partners to pledge to a 14 pound contribution per month. This will allow the channel to sustain its operating costs as we continue to spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in multiple languages across the globe. You be a part of this great legacy and donate today. You can pledge in two ways. www.imamhussein3.tv slash donate will take you direct to our donation page where you can pledge monthly. Or you can call or WhatsApp us on 0044-793-991763. Imam Hussein TV, your gateway to Karbala.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear respected brothers and sisters and dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV and welcome to this live Q&A session here from London where over the past 25 nights you have watched countless minutes on a complete dissection of the beautiful book of Nahj al Balagha and tonight we are here to answer your questions We'd first like to start by thanking the viewers from all over the world from sending in your questions. Keep sending them in because we are trying to answer as many as possible during these episodes. And we'd also like to thank you for your support and your viewership. But joining me tonight is none other than Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshawani. Assalamu alaikum Sayyid. Wa alaikum assalam, Habibi. Good to see you again. How are you? Brilliant. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Shall we get straight into it? Yeah, yeah. Let's get into it. Let's start questions. into it. Yep. Um, this, this one is a very, very nice question. This is why I put this first in the episode. Um, Sermon 96 of Imam Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, it says, Imam Ali says to his Shia, By Allah, I wish Muawiyah exchanges with me like dinars with dirhams, so that he takes from me 10 of you, i.e. the Shia, in return for one from them, i.e. one of his Syrian soldiers, O people of Kufa. Does this show negative light of the Shia of Imam Ali alayhi salam in his eyes? As in, does he not trust them? I think it's very normal um, for the leader of any group of people to have amongst those people um, the good and the bad. Um, there are those who are less mature than others. There are those who are not as knowledgeable as others. And there are those who cannot... Uh, face the trials in which others of them may. So if, if you look at the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, when a person looks in the Qur'an, you'll see that there are certain moments in the Qur'an where the companions of the Prophet are reprimanded. Mm. Where the uh, companions of the Prophet are reminded that their behavior on this particular incident was not the best of behavior. So Imam Ali alayhi salam talking about how some of those on his side of the army aren't as loyal as some of those on Muawiyah's side. I think the same thing happens with the Prophet when he's talking about the Muhajirun or the Ansar in some cases. Mm. If you look, for example, at battles like Uhud or Hunayn, the Quran clearly mentions how, although they were all Muslims alongside the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, they, they ran away from the battlefield. Yep. Um, and so the Quran really comes down quite harshly on them, you know. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is but a messenger of God and messengers have come before him. If he um, dies or rather he is killed, do you turn back on your heels in that way? Mm. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family says such a thing, that doesn't mean that those groups of Muslims are going to be looked down at in a negative way forever. But at mm. that moment, the trial that they faced in their life Mm. They did not come through with flying colors. Okay. So when Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al if a person shows you something like sermon, you know, that the sermon that you mentioned, 96, um, you know, because this is very famously said in lectures that if I, you know, give me one of Muawiyah's and I'll give you 10, ten of, of mine. mine yeah. Some people say, give me one of Muawiyah's and I'll give you nine of mine. When this is said, this is a reality that even Imam al Hussein alayhi salam faces that on his way to Karbala, there are people who slowly begin to leave him mm -hmm. because of different interests. When the going gets tough, there's not many who hung around at Uhud. And that should be a parable for life, in all honesty. Yeah. That sometimes in life, people expect everybody to be on the same level of commitment and the same level of valor and the same level of perseverance. It's not the case. So when someone tries to say that in Nahj al balagha Imam Ali attacks his own Shia, I think the Prophet, peace be upon his family, in the Quran, pretty much Allah attacks those um, of the Shia of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or the Sahab of Rasulullah for some of their behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if you want references on this, I would advise people to simply look at Surah 49, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3 to see how the Quran reprimanded those around the Prophet. Reprimanding reminding is vital for growth as well. If I sure, work in a sure. company and in that company, I see that mistakes can be made, for example. That's something very normal. There's no issue there. It can happen where a person tries to remind the people that what are you doing? 
Muawiyah is telling people to pray Salat al-Jum'ah on a Wednesday and they're listening wholeheartedly. Um, or, you know, he's, uh, he's, for example, ordering them that they should do this or that and they don't question. Whereas when Imam Ali alayhi salam was asking his followers to do something, all of a sudden there were a series yep. of questions uh, that were being asked. So that normally is the context in relation to that issue. I said, next question says, question for Sayyid Amman Nakshawani. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid, we see different people in the world today whose moral values are high and they do a lot of good deeds which we would expect a Muslim to be doing. What difference does it make on our actions for us slash people who embrace Islam? In other words, how should Muslims be different from non-Muslims in terms of their actions? So I think... Yeah, look, part of our innate nature, part mm. of our fitra is a disposition to understanding the difference between right and wrong. Mm. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا By the soul of the human or the self of the human and the one who perfected it. فَأَلْهَمَهَا mm. Ilham is a form of inspiration to the nafs. وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired within us a disposition mm -hmm. where we are able to decipher to a certain level innately within us there is an ability to decipher between what is right and what's wrong. Of course this was the subject of intense debate in Islamic theology for a long time between within the Sunni school and external of the um, Sunni school and within the Shia, you found that there were people who used to ask this question, that when I say something is right or wrong or good or evil, is that based on what Allah has decided something being good or something being evil? Or is there within me a disposition to understand um, ethics and a rational understanding of an ethical worldview. And let me give you an example on this. So good. When a person sees a blind man in a train station or a subway, yeah. the blind man's got this walking stick with him. And sometimes people will help the person if he maybe doesn't have his dog with him. Sure. When that blind man I could see is blatantly gonna walk towards the tracks and no one's stopping him. Mm. Nor is anyone guiding this blind man as they should. Sure. When I go and stop this blind man at this moment, mm. is this something that I've got to be a Muslim to do? Or is this within my innate nature? that if I see something like this where harm is going to happen, where evil is going to take place, where someone may lose their life, I'm going to go there. Do I need to be a person of religion? Or does my nafs say, hey, look, someone is about to be in trouble. Go and help. It is your duty. This is a good thing what you are about to do. Mm. Let me give you another example. What, what would the counter example be for that? For so example? some people will say, for example, that Religion teaches us Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar Enjoining the good and forbidding the evil We wouldn't have come to know this ourselves. But if that was also the case There's this debate that goes back and forth If I'm not uh, mistaken The likes of Allam al-Halli All the way to Muqaddas al-Ardabili mm. Would have discussions on Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar And whether it is part of our innate disposition True. Or is it just because it's in furu' al uh -huh. That you should enjoin the good and forbid the evil That it emerges Let me give you another example do I need to be a Muslim for me to know that telling the truth is a good thing and telling a lie is a bad thing? Do I need to be Muslim? No. No. There are non-Muslims out there who will say to you that I have reached a conclusion, part of my innate disposition, whether I'm Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, part of my innate disposition is as if I have a program within me mm -hmm. that straight away will tell you telling the truth is good and telling a lie is bad. Okay. Now, that means that on that front, to a certain extent, every single human being has that mechanism of an ethical framework through a rational understanding 
That is there. Now there was a debate between the Ash'arites and the Mu'tazila, the Ash'arites and the Shia, as to, for example, someone like Yazid. If Yazid goes to hell, mm. if God decides that Yazid goes to hell, you'll find a lot of people say, I'm not surprised. What if God decides to put Yazid in heaven? Some people in Islamic history said, God can decide whatever he wants. We cannot say anything. Okay. Others said, hold on a minute. God has given us a rational understanding True. of an ethical worldview. And aside from that, Islam has also shown us mm -hmm. that people who commit the following things, A, B, C, and D, will automatically be doomed. But you see how some people said, God is not obligated for our ethical understanding. God is the one. If he decides to put Yazid in heaven, you cannot say anything. We turn around and said, hold on a minute, within our nature, within our fitrah, a person like that who has oppressed children, oppressed women, killed people, my fitrah, I don't even need to be a Muslim, I recognize this guy is evil. Yeah. That's why. Sometimes people say, our love for Ahl al-Bayt al-fitrah. Yeah. Sometimes there are non-Muslims who have a love for Ahl al-Bayt. Why? Because even part of the disposition of the human is to look at people who are ethical, people who call towards good, people who seek to guide you towards perfection and to look up to them. So now, when we come back to the discussion, someone might say, okay, then I don't need to be a Muslim for me to be a good human being. A lot of people do that. Yeah, so I don't that. need to be a Muslim. I can be a good human being without Islam. What Islam does is that it provides you or supplements the boundaries for an ethical act. What do we mean? Backbiting is generally recognized by all human beings as a bad act. Yeah. You know, when you're sitting, you know, back chatting someone who's sitting in the corner of the room and you look, like, look at them or look at what they're wearing or look how they look and so on. Generally, it's seen as being a bad act. Yeah. Religion allows you to understand that while, yes, the Qur'an says in Surah 49 from verse number 11 onwards, وَلَا يَقْتَبْ بَعْضَكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُّ حِبُّ Yes, the Qur'an says this, but the, the hadith also tell us, however, there are exceptions to when backbiting is allowed. Sure. For example, I may see a dictator, a ruler who's oppressing people. I can't sit at home and say, I don't want to talk about what I just saw him do by beheading 600 people. No, I have to say something. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes even a marriage reference might be something that I may have to do some backbiting in for me to get across the point, mm. but it's allowed. Okay. So I think while there are people who are moral in the world today and sometimes sometimes more more sometimes another problem is moral relativity what do we mean quran tells us alcohol is haram sure it's haram for muslims to drink alcohol yep there are non-muslims who are very good moral people they will look after animals they look after humans they mm -hmm. fundraise for charity but for them there's no problem drinking alcohol you can still be a good human good heart drink alcohol for mm -hmm. us the moment you begin to morally decide, well, I'll pick and choose what's acceptable, that could have a domino effect in a destructive way. A person mm. who's a very nice human being, a very good human being, if you have no boundaries to them in their food life, their drink life, their sex life, there is no limit to what destruction can be caused. Ahsan Sayyid. Um, next question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid Ammar. In sermon 127, we find that in Nahj al that Imam Ali alayhi salam said, with regard to me, two categories of people will be ruined. Namely, he who loves me too much, and the, wow, and the love takes him away from rightfulness, and he who hates me too much, and the hatred takes him away from rightfulness. The best man with regard to me is he who is on the middle course. So be with him and be with the greater majority of Muslims. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand of protection is on keeping unity, you should beware of division. So some say today Shia fall into this trap of ghulu and extremism of Imam Ali alayhi salam because you, you see in Najaf and in Karbala and Karmain, Samarra, all around the world, the love of Imam Ali alayhi salam is unreal. Like so much so that people are willing to give up everything they've got for the love of Imam Ali alayhi sure. salam and that kind of stuff. Very true. So what, what, would, what would you say to that? Do we, have we fallen into ghulu? No, I think... I think the hadith is very easy to understand. Sure. 
There is no doubt that those who loved Imam Ali to an extent which became too much and took them away from rightfulness mm -hmm. are those who begun to call Imam Ali alayhi salam God. Okay. And that group of people, they, although minority, mm -hmm. the majority of the Shia, you go to the majority of Ithna Ashari Shia in the world today, you will find that 95, if not 98% of them will very clearly say that we believe in one God, we believe in the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, as being the final messenger of God. Mm -hmm. And we believe that Imam Ali السلام, is the Imam or the Khalifa of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. There were in certain parts of the lives of the Imams and even after the Imam's Ghayba, groups who emerged who started to say that Imam Ali السلام, was God. Was, was there pure intentions behind it or was it just to... To form no 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 I, chaos. I, I, I you know I, I don't think pure intention comes into this okay there's a theology which is very clear even if you want to go to um, an eye of the Quran you know such as in Nama Waliyakum Allahu wa Rasuluhu wa Ladina Aminu there's a wilaya which has a hierarchy sure um, what they begun to do is begun to do a ta'wil of verses of the Quran and that ta'wil was that they were always trying to find a way in which where Allah has mentioned, they tried to place Imam Ali's name. Now, these people, they saw some of the feats of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know, some of the feats of Imam Ali alayhi salam in his lifetime, no companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa could ever come near. None. Because the man was a composite of virtues. The man was a man of law, a man of philosophy, a man of ethics, a man of spirituality, a man of mysticism, bravery, valor. In every aspect of his life, he is in a completely different level to those who were with the Prophet, peace be upon his family. Definitely. But when a person saw things like, you know, Khaybar and, you know, look at that <laughs> phenomenal performance, some people were like, wow, this is on a different level. Yeah. Um, and so in his lifetime, and then in the lifetime of the Imams after him, all mm. the way until Imam al Askari alayhi salam, there were people from amongst the community who started to say that Imam Ali alayhi salam, they started to say that he is God. Mm. And of course, that without a doubt is the first group that he talks about. Their love for me took them away from rightfulness. Someone says, no, that's you Shia today. How is it us Shia today? Us Shia today, on the contrary, when we look at ourselves, we are those people. Who believe, as I said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi And I believe that Imam Ali alayhi salam is the wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I look at my beliefs very clearly, I believe that Imam Ali alayhi salam was a student of the city of knowledge that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he himself says, I'm one of the servants of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So it doesn't apply. Then there was a third group and those who had hate. All the way yeah. to the other end. So you got one extreme, those who made <laughs> him God. You got the other extreme, those who had severe hate for him. And that's of course Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. Mm. That is Amr ibn al-As, Mughira bin Shu'ba, Ziyad bin Abi, Walid bin Uqba. Um, those who fought him at Jamal and Safin and Nahrawan. Yep. Of course the Khawarij and the likes of Ibn Muljam and others. And then uh, there was always groups in history as well who brought up their kids on the hate of mm -hmm. Imam Ali mm -hmm. but we cannot say that this exists um, on a majority level today because even if you look at the Sunni world they believe Imam Ali is the fourth Khalifa if you look at the Shia world of course we believe he's the first Imam mm -hmm. of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt but there was definitely a period where the hate reached the level where even names um, of narrators, they had to change from Ali to Ulay so that that hadith would get through. There were people who had to live in Taqiyya and say that we dissociate from Imam Ali alayhi salam. And people always ask me, that, well, why do Shia do Taqiyya? I always reply by saying, well, if you're being led by a bunch of animals, then Taqiyya might be a good option. <laughs> Ahsan Sayyid. Um, next question says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid Ammar. Um, Surah 3 verse 144. Says Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Other messengers have gone before, come before him. If he were to die or to be killed, would you regress into disbelief? Those who do so will not harm Allah whatsoever, and Allah will reward those who are grateful. The question is: So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa could have been killed. How comes you have never dissected in depth the death of the Prophet? Do you believe that he was poisoned by one of the wives with the help of the first and second caliph? 
If yes, what is the evidence? Well, I think um, the story concerning the death of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, is a very, a very blurry, vague, what seems to happen towards the end of his life. I don't think the last few days of his life are the smoothest. Even the transition in terms of the government that followed him is not smooth at all. There's mm -hmm. clearly hustle and bustle and loud voices as he's passing away and at Saqifa. One only has to look at the hadith about the calamity of Thursday, yep. um, the pen and paper incident where there's clearly a ruckus between the companions. Um, and one also has to look at Saqifa and see in Saqifa the Ansar and the Muhajir virtue raising voices against each other and becomes a punch up. Something's gone wrong towards the end of his life. Now, the normal um, analysis of his death is that the Prophet, peace be upon his family, at the Battle of Khaybar was given something which had poison. Yeah. Uh, by, uh, you know, a Jewish um, member of the community at the time. And then eventually he dies. But Khaybar was how many years before he died? Khaybar was... Four years before he died. Now, I don't know poison taking four years to kill you. Um, <laughs> but I do know that. Look, if you're going to look at, for example, um, certain texts of Shia creed, mm. you know, we, we sometimes refer to Shia creed, Mufid or Saduq, you'll see that it does mention, and we believe that the Prophet was poisoned um, from Khaybar. However, if he's poisoned, if he dies because of the Battle of Khaybar, which is a few years before he dies, something seems to be amiss over here. Some Shia scholars in our history had concluded that he was actually poisoned and became a Shaheed on a number of, you know, either because of the suspicious circumstances, either because they believe in a plot, either because ma minna illa maqtul aw masmum, not one of us is um, except that they are either poisoned, poisoned or, or they killed. are killed. Yep. Um, so when you bring all of this together, there is an opinion that does exist in the history of Shia, whether you go back to certain tafasir works in sure. early Shi'i thought, or whether you come to certain scholarship today. But I still believe that while clearly the Khaybar poisoning taking four years is a problem, bringing together the fragments and you know the exact jigsaw puzzle when the questioner says to me, how comes you've not discussed this? Well, firstly, it might be a reason why a thousand years of scholarship hasn't openly discussed this because whether we like it or we don't, any discussion concerning the first two caliphs is always a sensitive thing. Yep. You've got to remember these are two pillars of Sunni Islam. And really raising questions about their behavior always results in a backlash. Um, it's, it's always interesting who picks what's sectarian. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, definitely. Um, and who sets the boundaries of sectarian um, if they want to be sectarian. Sometimes you'll find that even amongst the Salafis, when they want to be sectarian in their language, that's not an issue. But if a Shi'i begins to discuss these things as sectarian, at the end of the day, we have to look at the benefits, inshallah, of what can bring the people together. Ahsan Sayyid. Now, Sayyid, before we continue, I just wanted to tell the dear viewers that please, please, we are receiving hundreds of messages and hundreds of questions. So please, if your question isn't answered tonight or over the coming nights, please do not be disheartened. There is only one Sayyid Amman Naqshawani after all. Now, Sayyid, uh, moving on quickly. Uh, this next question says, Assalamu alaikum Sayyid Ammar. Why wasn't the message of Islam clear cut for everyone so that there was no doubt as to who would be Khalifa or who we should follow? Why did God have to test us with differences in all the different schools? Since Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was the final messenger, why didn't God just tell us, here is the message, and so no one could deny it? I think, I think this question can also lead to another question, which is, why didn't he just, just say, Ali is your khalifa in, in, in the Qur'an, after you? Clear cut, everyone knows, khalas, done. If we want to go down that line, why don't we just say, why didn't God just make everybody Muslim and we could just be a bunch of robots on the earth, you know what I mean? Um, ever since Habil and Qabil had a fight, we knew that human beings have different reasons for why they do things. Humanity will be rough. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that when we look at the previous nations, they were also given clear guidance with a holy text and they split into sects. Sure. Um, the Jewish community with the Torah, the Christian community with the Injil, 
the Muslim community with the Quran. Even if I go outside and I begin to look at Hinduism or Buddhism or Sikhism, you cannot tell me there is only one strand mm. of thought. Um, ultimately, I sit here today in 2023, and to me, the religion of Islam is clear as day. Um, people will say, well, in which way? Well, we all as Muslims believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all believe in all his prophets. And there's no way that my prophet, peace be upon his family, would have left the world without making clear who is going to be the leader of the Muslim world. Rationally speaking, a man who taught me how to brush my teeth and a man who taught me how to walk into the bathroom mm. um, using whichever foot um, and a man who taught me how to, for example, chew my food is not going to leave the world and say, well, I'll leave it to you guys to choose. Yeah. I'm not really going to tell you. I think the incident of Ghadir is so clear. It's unbelievable. Um, and the only problem someone would have with Ghadir would be if they look at Islamic history and have to begin to question how Islamic history panned out and why Ghadir did not end up in Imam Ali being leader, that could be the only reason that someone could reject Ghadir. Mm. Um, and so for us, when a person says, why did Allah not make it clear? Da'wat al-ashira wa andar ashirata kal aqrabin He said that Ali is my wasi and khalifa after me. The amount of other plaudits that he gave. Inni tarakum fikum al thaqalain I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. However many ways you want to look at the laugh, the ma'na is still the same. Mm -hmm. There might, you know, someone might say tawatur al-lafdi um, is not there. Well, tawatur al-ma'na is certainly there. And at the end of the day, that tawatur exists in all schools in Islam that I leave behind for you, the Quran and my Isra, the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Some mentions, for example, ma anta mastaktum bihima, lan tadhillu ba'di abada. There is more than enough there to hold on to the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. So for sure. me, you know what? I've seen so many people who have become Shia yeah. in my lifetime. They will tell you how it was clear as day. Mm -hmm. I have not seen many people leave the school of Ahlul Bayt. That should be enough for a person. Ah, uh, next question says, Assalamu alaikum Sayyid Ammar from Sydney, Australia. Quick question. How can we be more confident in the unseen and, uncert and uncertainties of the afterlife knowing that we obviously can't see the splitting of the sea or miracles like the Quran or see angels like the Imams, etc. Thank you, Sayyid. That's a good question. Yeah, without a doubt, it is a good question. Um, you know, confidence in the unseen. Mm. Um, the reality is this could be answered in many ways. Look, first and foremost, there are many things that we're never um, necessarily going to understand the depths of. Um, the soul of the human being. Mm. Even, you know, when the ayah talks about, you know, yes, alunaka an ruh they ask you concerning the ruh, they ask you concerning the soul or the spirit. Even that knowledge was little of what was given to the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. um, the articles of faith in Islam, of course, is the belief in the unseen. Um, yep. Our eyes cannot fathom certain creations, which maybe certain prophets could. Mm. Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب. There are certain pieces of technology that until today have found it difficult to really show everything that exists in this world. And we're still finding new creation which were in the past something which we thought would be in the unseen. Mm -hmm. Now with technology, we're slowly trying to see what in the past people could not see. Yep. And if someone a hundred years ago um, could have easily turned around and said that, you know what, I've got to see it to believe it. Mm -hmm. Now, subhanAllah, technology is revealing a lot of things for us. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, you know, when someone's saying, I want to believe in the unseen, there's different premises a person can use. I believe in these prophets, these prophets who come to me, I don't see a question mark on their character, no blemish on their behavior. Therefore, that prophet I recognize as Sadiq and Amin yep. when he therefore begins to tell me about the unseen and provides me with a text which is incorruptible, a text which I believe outweighed or outdone the minds of those who were there at the time, 
that would be enough for me to build the premise on believing in the unseen and having that leap of faith. Ahsan Sayyid. Uh, next question says, which I think you've answered before in previous Q&A questions, but we'll ask it. Assalamu uh, alaikum Sayyid Ammar. Did Adam and Eve's children commit incest? If not, how did the population grow? Yes, certainly in, 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 in Islamic literature, there was opinions that were posited that Adam and Eve, alayhim as salams, uh, children would have had to have committed incest for humanity to grow, but no, we reject that. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same Lord who created Adam and Eve um, from clay, He could also create other creations from clay, uh, from clay and allow them you know, to continue as that particular group of humanity. Incest is disgusting, <laughs> incest is haram, and so how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for a law for that group Mm -hmm. And then later on say, no, 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 this only was allowed for them. It brings me back sometimes even to the temporary marriage example. You know, sure. people say, uh, you know, these Shia, they practice temporary marriage, it's disgusting and so on and so forth. But they can't deny that it was there in the time of the Prophet. So then when you tell them, they say, yeah, but he, he allowed it first and then he banned it. So why were those companions given special privileges yeah. and not the rest of the Muslim community as the religion continue to grow and expand. Because that would have made life easier for them and hard for the Muslims that came after. Why would there be a law which is ethical in the time of the Prophet, as you said, yeah. and then later on it would be like, nah, you know what, actually I'm going to ban it for the rest of you. <laughs> Clearly the companions, when they went away, so we don't believe incest was allowed for Adam's family and then it was rejected later on. Ahsan, uh, next question says, what are the similarities between Gautama Buddha and Imam Ali alayhi salam? Buddha and Imam Ali alayhi salam similarities. That's an interesting one. I, I think the most similarities that have ever been done in comparison between Buddha would be with Khadr alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. I can't remember coming across discussions of the similarity of the similarity between Buddha and Imam Ali I think what a person may be able to do is look for the idea of for a person to try and, you know, in their life um, live, I suppose, in a way ascetically could be a similarity. A person who finds some sort of asceticism and tries to define um, a path of life um, built on cultivating virtue and goodness and in pursuit of the unimaginable, unseen. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you know, because Buddhism's conception of... You can't really say Buddhism has a conception of, of belief in one God. So it's not going to be in the articles of faith of Buddhism, of the belief in one God. What you've got to do is try yeah. and look at some of their concepts um, within Buddhism. Sure. To try and understand if there are concepts concerning a belief in that which is, you know, not perceivable, uh, not creatable, not tangible, um, and and trying to somehow build a world around that. Now, whether that is because the whole idea is, of course, Buddhists are not ahl al kitab. No, um, but there was a certain period where, on the, on the basis of them believing you know, in, an, in, in, in a force that is not perceptible and not, that the eyes cannot perceive, that could have been seen as similar in certain cultures to um, a Tawheed type concept. Okay. Now, how much remains of Buddha's original teachings today uh, is open to question. Mm. Um, and I think all you can do is maybe try and look in their biographies um, it might be a period of, of, of seeking nirvana in, in Buddha uh, by leaving the family. Imam Ali has a period of seclusion from the mm -hmm. Muslim community, okay. obviously from Saqifa um, until he becomes Khalifa. But does Imam Ali abandon his family to reach that or society to reach that? Those could be areas where a person might open up discussions on similarities. See, I always like to do this when I look at different personalities. And I, I'm, I, I don't know if you have the answer to this question, but... Um, Buddha, 
at his time, was there any prophets? Well, it's a good time? question because the, we know that in Islam we believe in 124,000 prophets. Yeah. But we only know of them mentioned, let's say, Quran and Hadith, we might get to 30s or something. Let's yeah. say, for example, um, let's say in the Quran we might get to mid 20s, and in the Hadiths we add a few others yeah. who are mentioned in the Hadiths and of the Bani Israel prophets. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says we have sent a prophet to every nation. Sure. Um, India has had prophets, China has had prophets, Greece has had prophets. That's crazy to think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so because of that, there is no denying that certain personalities, when a person looks at their words that have reached us, I don't know how many are original, I don't know how many have been tampered with, I don't know how many are authentic, and therefore it's very difficult to reconstruct. Mm. Um, but clearly, in many cases, these are wise people. Ahsan. Yeah. Uh, next question says, Salam alaikum Sayyid Ammar, I am in year 8 and my question is, I struggle with speaking to non-Shi'as as I am a convert who has developed such a big love for the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. How do I socialize with them and spread the message of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam? I think, um, firstly, it's commendable yeah. that the person in year 8 has converted to the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. About 13 years old? 12, yeah, that's, 12, it's really commendable. Um, and very inspirational and you know credit to them in this month of Ramadan yeah. at that age I always say learning isn't about the family you're from mm. learning isn't about how externally religious you look yeah learning is about attitude and humility mm -hmm. there are many people who live lives where they look culturally religious they know how to culturally act religious mm -hmm. but they hate reading books on islam they hate learning about religion they even hate the idea of getting up to pray mm. and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep shaitan away from us if that affects us but then you have this person who's in year 8 13 14 years old who's thinking of how can i bring people towards imam al hujja ajalallah farajo sharif and that is something amazing and commendable but all i can advise in your age is your akhlaq is the beginning if your akhlaq amongst your school friends, you don't have to go to them and say, do you know there was Imam Ali and do you know the Quran is this and do you know this hadith and do you know hadith? You don't have to do that. Yep. Your akhlaq will be enough for people to come. As long as they could see ethical traits in you of being someone respectful, someone kind, someone polite, someone humble, um, someone who's always there as a shoulder to cry on, so on and so forth, then that inshallah will bring them towards you. If you find saying I'm finding it hard to socialize, with people because I'm a convert, um, try and look for a circle of friends, be they Muslim and non-Muslim who have good principles, good morality, inshallah Allah will open the doors for you. Excellent. Uh, now, next question says, Assalamu alaikum Sayyid, there is a lot of difference between what the Shia and what the Sunnis believe about what happened at Karbala. I was wondering, who do we, the Shia, take our view from? It's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> Well, of course, Karbala, as we all know, every single Muslim in the world mm. um, believes that Imam al Hussein salam, was, of course, killed at Karbala. Yeah. And every single Muslim in the world believes that Imam al Hussein salam, and the family of the Prophet were oppressed at Karbala. Sure. So, whether you're Sunni or whether you're Shia, um, everyone believes that there was a major catastrophe and a massacre that took place at Karbala. Mm -hmm. And that sacred core of history, the belief that in the 61st year after Hijrah, Imam al Hussein and the family of Rasulullah went through a very, very awful, oppressive ordeal, is agreed upon in all literature of all Muslims. Sure. Barring the odd time. You may have had the odd scholar of some schools of Islam who might have said Imam al Hussein went against the Khalifa of his time. You always hear this every once in a while, but I have to say the majority of Sunni, majority of Shia, all believe that Imam al Hussein salam, was so beloved to the Prophet that what happened to him was an Tragic. absolute tragedy and yeah. catastrophe. You don't have to be Shia to just believe this. Mm. Now, from there, when a person begins to reconstruct what took place at Karbala, we know very well that it's not easy to do so. There is no speaker in the world, there is no scholar in the world who could tell you exactly what took place with the exact details of what took place on the 10th of Muharram. Down what, to the what, finest details. Yeah, look, you yeah. can't. 
History involves historiography, history involves people's opinions, people's political motives, narrator's opinions, narrator's motives. Um, even certain people putting masala on some of the stories and adding spices to some of the conclusions. It does happen whether you are Shia or non-Shia. What there is is, however, a core mm. that the haq was with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yeah. And that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam made clear that I will not pledge allegiance to Yazid and that Yazid was a tyrant. You will find Sunni and Shia will believe in this. Now, it's interesting also that one of the main narrators of what happened at Karbala was Lut bin Yahya, Abu Makhnaf. But that we don't really have the whole of Abu Makhnaf's work, Maqtal al Hussein alayhi salam, and therefore. But what we do see is that later chroniclers of Karbala mm. and later uh, historians, whether it's um, you know whether it's Tabari, whether it's Ibn Sa'ad, um, you know Kufan scholars who of course emerge and talk about Karbala, they do use somebody like um, you know Abu Mikhnaf. Okay. Therefore, we also have a second source would be the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would talk about what took place at Karbala, sometimes in their Amali. So there's dictations of people like Sheikh al-Saduq or Sheikh al-Mufid. You know, Imla mm -hmm. in Arabic school, people would do Imla. Imla would be dictation. Yeah. Amali are some of these dictations or lessons or lectures or whatever you want to call them, majalis even, um, where, people, where the Imams discuss a certain portion of Karbala. Mm. We also have books like Bukhari and Muslim, which talk about the treatment of the head of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam after Karbala. Um, so when you bring all of these together, mm -hmm. you can either have works from the Imams in the sense that were narrated to us by the ulama. Yep. And you have non-Shia who also have discussions of Karbala. You might even have certain ziyara literature, which may give us an indication of some of the masaib of what took place. Uh, at Karbala, uh, but I think even when you compare Shia and Sunni works, the ultimate conclusion is that Karbala was one of the most tragic days in the history mm. uh, of the religion of Islam, and inshallah we can build our lives around that. So would you say, would you say those who, like Abu Mikhnif, um, who came, I would assume as journalists to document the, the story of Karbala, or if there was, let's say, a group of people who came to write down Exactly what's happening at Karbala, Umar bin Sa'ad coming out, Imam Hussein coming out. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are they to be held accountable for not defending Imam Hussein? Yeah, I wouldn't put Abu Mikhnaf in that category, but more I'd put, for example, um, Hamid bin Muslim. Yeah. People like example. that, yeah. They would be more in that category of people. And it's very, very suspect what's happened to Hamid bin Muslim. You know, he's that person who sometimes we hear in the musibah, he comes to give water to the daughter of Imam Hussein mm. and she asks him, are you with us or are you yeah. against us? And he says, I'm neither with you nor I'm against you. So what's he doing there? If he's neither with Imam al Hussein exactly. and he's neither with Yazid, either at that point he's come to a conclusion that although I'm working on behalf of the government, no longer can I say I'm one of them. Some people say he became distraught. Others say he continued to work for the Umayyads. Very suspicious about what happens to Hamid bin Muslim afterwards. Does mm. he become one of the Tawabun? Does he join the path of the Ahl al-Bayt. But yeah, uh, listen, if a person seeing the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, being beheaded and they're just standing there taking notes, that person's heart is a dead heart. That person could have easily done a hurb in Yazid al riyahi and sacrificed his life um, and come towards the path of um, the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt um, alayhi wa salam. Uh, such people may fall even under the category of sami'at bidhalika, faradiyat bih. They yeah. heard about what happened in Karbala and they were pleased with it or they accepted it. Because they didn't do anything. Yeah. Yet. Now, uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, Salam alaikum, Sayyid Ammar. Did Imam Ali alayhi salam write a sermon on the notion of an eye for an eye? Notion of an eye for an eye, did he write? I think the closest thing you'll find is in his final will, which mm -hmm. I, if I'm not mistaken, is letter 47 of Nahj al mm hmm when he comes towards the end, he begins to talk about um, maintain communication and exchange of opinion yep. amongst yourselves. You know, you should um, strengthen your ties and remove your differences. And then he says, <laughs> if the strike of Ibn Muljam is the one that kills me, then only strike him with one strike. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, eye for an eye, what Islam does to the previous... Um, 
biblical notion is that Islam seems to add more compassion with it. So in the Quran, there is a lot of discussions. Of course, the discussion on qisas and retaliation, mm. um, an eye for an eye is within the Quran. One can refer to uh, surahs like Al-Ma'idah for this. But what also happens is that the Quran talks of forgiveness. Now, Imam Ali alayhi salam, in his case, with Ibn Muljam, if his strike, if his one strike is the strike that kills me, then you strike him with one, one strike. strike. Yeah. Do not mutilate his body. Sure. For the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family used to say, do not even mutilate the body of a dog with rabies, rabies yeah. or a rabid dog. If I see a dog which has rabies, I see a cat on the ground, I see a donkey on the street, I should not come and poke and hit and stab. That is a creation of God. Yeah. Imam Ali alayhi salam likewise is turning around and saying that Ibn Muljam struck me with one strike, la'natullah alayhi, then if you are going to strike him, strike him with one strike. Do not shed the blood, he says in his final will, of the Muslims under the banner that the Imam has been assassinated. Because hmm. sometimes, what, what did Saddam Hussein, for example, with places like, let's say, Dujel, mm. um, yeah. or Karbala, or Najaf, or Nasriya, Basra, Samawa, all these areas, Saddam Hussein blatantly, if they found that there were 10, 15 who had made a coup or assassination attempt on him, they come and exterminate the whole village. Yep. You'll find certain European fascist dictators would destroy a whole area if there was two, three people who were known as being troublemakers. Yeah. Imam used to say that Ibn Muljam's one strike, if that's the strike that ends up being the one that kills me, then strike him with one strike. Strike him with one strike, sorry, in, in the sense that strike him with one strike that is going to kill him? Or strike yeah, him to kill him, that would be enough. Okay. Yeah. I thought if it doesn't kill him, let him go. But yeah. anyway, uh, Sayyid Ammar, thank you so much for joining me tonight. We will see you inshallah over the next coming nights inshallah. to answer the dear viewers questions. My dear brothers and sisters, continue to send in your questions. We will go through all of them and we are trying to pick ones that are more relevant to Nahj al but also more relevant to everyday life and for your Shia identity. Again, brothers and sisters, don't be disheartened if your questions do not end up making it through. You can contact Sayyid Ammar via SayyidAmmar.com and that will be for your own leisure to watch lectures and the sorts. But from me, Dr. Sayyid Ammar Nakhshawani and the team here at Imam Hussein TV, we bid you Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. But from me and the team here at Imam Hussein TV, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Now, a lot goes into producing the shows that you love here on Imam Hussein TV. Maybe half an hour for you, but it's hours for us. We have many factors to consider when producing our shows. Time, cost, set design, sourcing speakers and guests. It takes us about an hour to film three hours to edit, two hours to render, and you, well, you watch it in 30 to 40 minutes. Hours just for 30 minutes. What is the I Am Husseini show? Well, it's a show that provides you, the dear viewers, a gateway, a window, a pathway, whatever you want to call it, to visit Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam and Abu Al Fadl Abbas alayhi salam at the comfort of your own home. I am a host at Ahkam SOS. It is a show which entails with people sending in the Ahkam questions, which me and Sheikh Ali Maash discuss and give them their answers. My show is Her Thoughts, which is a show featuring a rotating panel of female presenters discussing a range of topics from a female perspective. Verses of Love aims to be the post majlis majlis. It tries to bring the community together to continue engaging with the Masaib of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam. I've had the honor of working and directing and producing documentaries for the Imam Hussein TV3 channel. 
So the late night show is essentially it's a talk show. I had guests all the way from self-development experts, media experts, sales directors. My show, Live in London, it needs no introduction with world-renowned scholar, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Sometimes it's difficult for us to do the research. It takes us sometimes a week, two weeks to find answers for certain questions. Sometimes the questions don't even get answered and we have to roll them on until next week. But I guess this is a problem that is actually, you know, a good headache and worth having. One of the main difficulties which we come across is um, getting female participants to participate on the show. After the show, when we get the emails coming through from the women um, in our society, in our community, and it really shows us that women relate more to a female speaker. Among some of the difficulties I'd say is the late nights, with a pretty hectic schedule for all the reciters who have probably come from one or two majalis beforehand. Sometimes you just have this magical moment where the reciter says a line that connects and lets you release all of that emotion, which helps you connect with Aba Abdullah and therefore with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I filmed these documentaries during COVID. That always stays with me because I think that was a difficulty that I thought I will face. Yet I think Imam Al-Hussein Salam Allah Alayhi opened so many doors and made everything so easy for me. How much can we laugh and joke on an Islamic channel? Especially when the channel is associated to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But the best part of the show is actually, it's the fun part of it. So that's, that's the games. The best thing about this show, you can actually speak and discuss and actually voice their opinions and questions to Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. We've come so far, yet still have so much more to achieve. Support us so that we can support your children in bringing them more knowledge and content. Because Imam Hussein TV is your gateway to Karbala. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم اسمي عفل عايد أمر ست سنين أنا مشتاق البابا بابا مات من سنة صغيرة أنا عريب بالعيد لعبة اسمي عايد اسمي عايد أولا أربعة من بابا Sisters Rafal and Russell wanted dolls for their dua to come true. Thanks to your donations, we made that happen. <laughs> Let's spread joy this Eid by giving gifts to orphans. Your donation can make a child dream come true. أنا يعني عرضت حالات كثيرة حقيقة تكاليفها كانت كبيرة ولكن يحز بقلبي لما أشوف في حالة من الحالات مثل الأم علي والعلاج ترى ألفين دولار ثلاثة آلاف دولار مو مبلغ كبير يعني فهذا يحز بالقلب ما في شخص يقدر يتكفل ويدفع ألفين لو ثلاثة آلاف دولار حتى أم علي تهتم بأطفالها شنو دعيتي؟ شال الطيب الطيب ماما؟ ما شاء الله على اسم على اسم بنت الحسين عليه السلام شاطرة؟ اي والله شاطرة؟ اي شلون؟ طلعت اول عصف ما شاء الله طالعة على اول عصف يا حياتي انت عندك العاب؟ ما عندك ولا لعبة؟
ان شاء الله ماما تتعالج وبعدين تحتفلون كلكم الاسره كلكم عائلتكم تحتفلون نسال الله تعالى ان يعينكم ويعيننا لتقديم مبلغ العلاج لام علي ان شاء الله وترجع هي سالمه غانمه وتربي عيالها